Aloha and Mabuhai. Mabuhai. Today, we here at Navigating the Journey, we are going to visit with a dear, dear friend. And you know, I only talk to dear friends. I met Toy and when we both worked for the city and county, I guess in 1972, maybe. But we're going to talk to Toy today about Filipino Heritage Month in Hawaii. And it's one of those areas that I know nothing about. And we work with, we meet with, we visit with all of us on this island, have friends that are Filipino, and yet we come to Filipino Heritage Month and discover we don't know anything. So I've asked Toy to be our guest to talk about Filipino Heritage Month, about the Filipinos in Hawaii, when they came, how long they've been here, and everything we need to know. So, aloha, Toy. Aloha. Or mabuhai. Mabuhai. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about Toy. Now, of course, I, I remember because we were, we, I started at the city at the same time. You were already there, I think. And so tell us about you. Now, you told me you worked for, in Manila, was it? Yes, uh, after I retired from the city. Uh, <clears throat> well, I came to the United States myself in 1957 as a student. And uh, I was representing my, my parents' store uh, the, in the uh, World's Trade Fair in New York way back in 1957. Uh, we attended that fair at the Coliseum for about a month. And then a month later, we also attended the Washington State Fair in Seattle, Washington. That was the time when the Space Needle was open. And then I went back to San Francisco to stay with my an auntie of mine. A while over there, my father called me and said, you know, son, since you're already there, why don't you take this opportunity to continue your studies? So, you know, Filipino culture, if your parents tell you something and they're supporting you completely, all you can say is yes, sir, or opo. So uh, that's how I ended up at the University of Michigan where I had an older sister uh, already enrolled at the university under a Smith Mon Fulbright scholarship. But uh, my first winter was a horrible experience. It was 20 degrees <laughs> below zero. Uh, after yeah. that winter, I decided to vacation in Hawaii where my sister my eldest sister at that time just opened a store in Waikiki. So I asked her if I could stay with them instead and attend the University of Hawaii. So I transferred in, I think it was February, uh, uh, December of 1959, and I've been here ever since. So, yes. Now tell us about our. Uh, the Philippine Filipino Heritage Month. How when did the the Filipinos come to Hawaii as a group? You know, the, the, <clears throat> the first official group of Filipinos that's uh, recognized, uh, at least in whatever historical records there are, is the sixteen Filipinos that uh, came on board a steamship. Uh, recruited by the Hawaii Planters, uh, Hawaii Sugar Planters Association. And they arrived here on uh, December 6th. Uh, no, December 21, I should say, uh, 1906. Uh, there were 16 of them. That was the first official group of Filipinos formally recognized as the first immigrants into Hawaii. I think uh, a good almost 200,000 Filipinos uh, followed after them, you know, in uh, 
and botches over the years, the last of which came before the Philippines declared its independence in 1946. And most of them uh, ended up uh, in the plantation, of course. The first batch uh, was uh, all assigned here on, on Oahu, all 16 of them. Uh, no, I, I take that back. They were, they were divided into two groups. One group stayed in the Waipahu area, whatever sugar plantation there was at that time, in another, the other group went to Kona. Uh, so uh, that's where they were located. Anyway, uh, from then on, the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association kept on recruiting uh, Filipino far farmers uh, until the declaration of Philippine independence in 1946. I forgot how many thousand Filipinos eventually ended up under this program uh, prior to Philippine independence. Now, when you talk about Philippine independence, let's go back and talk about the war in the mm -hmm. Philippines. Yes. The Americans call it uh, one thing, but you call it the war of independence. Well, uh, you, you know, after the Spanish-American War, uh, the, the United States uh, took over uh, the Philippine archipelago uh, <clears throat> as a commonwealth. And in 1935, under the tidings Magdafi Act, uh, they said that after a period of 10 years as a territory of the United States, we would be given our independence. And unfortunately, after the 10 years, was immediately after the end of the Second World War. Uh, the Philippines declared its independence anyway. Uh, the whole economy was in ruin. It was right after the war. Uh, America kept its word, but I think it was the wrong time economically for the Philippines to do so. So, but the, now, how did the war, the the Filipinos that were here, mm -hmm. because they came before that war of independence. How yes. did that affect the ones that were already here? Uh, I don't think it affected them at all. Uh, they continued to work in, in the plantations. I don't know if there is no official record of them being recruited from the plantations to work, say, in Pearl Harbor or Right. Uh, them, uh, because most of them were uneducated and uh, I, I don't know whether the type of labor, skilled labor that was required for the war machine uh, was something that they could provide. That, yeah, that's my assessment. Well, you had so many Filipinos that were in the war, uh, in World War II, that were on the American side, you know, of course. And so there was so much going on. Up, and, and now you're gonna have to get me straight on this. The ones that served in the war on the American side are still having trouble getting pensions and all of that kind of stuff. Which ones that are left alive? I, I, I think that, that issue has been settled. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I think the, in the last act of Congress, uh, they decided to appropriate enough money to give all of those Filipinos uh, located in the Philippines, the, the veterans anyway, uh, a lump sum of 15,000 and uh, the same thing with the uh, uh, people that were uh, living here in Hawaii or the other parts of the United States. But uh, the latest was that there was a, in, in addition to that, they were awarded the so-called Congressional Gold Medal 
uh, under the leadership of uh, General Taguba, uh, who was then acting on behalf of AARP to push this particular issue in Congress. And it was approved. Mm -hmm. So that, that issue has been settled. That's wonderful. Um, Domingo Los Banos was a yes. friend. And he was, he was on the show with me. And he was very proud of his, of the medal. You know, he was wonderful. We talk, talk, we talk story all the time. Uh, and I'll come back to him. So tell us again now. Now, once your independence and people are beginning to move from the plantation into other, where well, their children are mm -hmm. getting educated and they're moving into other jobs and other things. So what happens with the culture after that period, once you leave the plantation or, or while they were at the plantation, did they hold on to their culture? They uh, let, let me backtrack a little. Um, because after, graduate, uh, after I uh, finished my master's program at the University of Hawaii in 1960, uh, I was fortunate enough to end up with a job also at the university. And uh, at the university, I, I noticed that, uh, I felt anyway at that time, that the Filipinos sometimes hide their own identity. They didn't want to be recognized as Filipinos. They'd say they're part Spanish or somebody else. But uh, there was one activity where uh, we were able to participate, you know, representing our own ethnic culture. This is the Kapala Pala uh, Queen Contest, where the Japanese selected their own queen, the Korean selected their own queen, the Filipino selected their own queen. Uh, I, I remember dancing Filipino folk dances uh, with the students uh, from the East Coast Center at that time, but I had a feeling that they were ashamed uh, to some extent, to even accept that they were Filipino. Uh, because, uh, you know, we were the latest group of immigrants that came from the plantations. But uh, the Filipinos that have started to come in uh, since the uh, Philippine independence, uh, most of them are educated. You know, they're uh, trained engineers, doctors, physicians. Uh, so, type of immigrant that started coming after uh, the Philippine independence was a different kind of person. Uh, they were no longer the uneducated uh, agricultural uh, workers recruited by the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association. So, so now you have a different group, but on the whole, I'm talking about holding on to your culture, your music, your dance. Mm -hmm. oh the storytelling about holding on to your culture, bringing it with you. The, yeah, the uh, uh, people that did this were mostly the uh, town associations or association of provinces uh, representing the area that they came from uh, in the Philippines. And uh, usually they, they select a queen, they, uh, they elect officers for their town organizations. Uh, that's the, how they hang on to, and that continues to this day. Now, tell us about the Philcon Center. Well, you, you were part of that. So tell us about the center. It's beautiful. The, 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 the Filipino Community Center, uh, uh, was a dream for, I don't know, decades, uh, at, at least by some people I know. Uh, one of those that uh, saw the need for one was my late sister, Mrs. Soledad Alfonsel, who was married to Ambassador Trinidad Alfonsel in the mid 70s. And they felt that there was a need to have one that could be used as a meeting place for the many different Filipino organizations on this island. Similar to uh, 
at that time, the Japanese Cultural Center uh, and also the Korean one. Uh, <clears throat> the Okinawan did not have theirs yet. Uh, it's located in Waikiki. The effort to, uh, to do this, uh, there, there were, in fact, there were several efforts to create, uh, to spearhead the creation of a Filipino community center. But the one that succeeded uh, putting up the uh, wonderful facility that there is in Waipahu was headed by Roland Casamina and uh, Eddie Flores of LNL Bank. Yeah. Uh, between the two of them, they were able to gather enough people uh, to obtain the money from the uh, state and federal government and solicited donations from the community uh, to put up the center. And it was inaugurated, I think, in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. It's a wonderful facility. Uh, the only thing is uh, the building cost uh, roughly uh, $13 million to construct. But they had only about nine and a half million dollars in uh, money collected from grants and uh, community contributions. Most of it were grants from the city, from the state, and from the federal government. And they ended up uh, borrowing a four million dollar loan uh, to complete the construction of the building. Unfortunately, uh, that is now the, uh, uh, the thing that weighs down uh, the programs and other things that are done at least in, in the Filipino Community Center because a substantial portion of its revenues either generated within the center or collected from the contributions outside uh, have to go in paying off that debt. Oh, wow. And uh, I, I think the payments now are running around 18000 a month. Oh. Well, when I was there, it was 23000 We were able to refinance it at a lower rate, so it went down to twenty one. And then it's been refinanced like, uh, twice since I left. And they were able to pare down the payments uh, a little bit more. Yeah. But uh, that is a tremendous financial burden, you know, from the little revenues uh, that the center generates. But do they have programs there regularly so they can generate income? Uh, not at the present time. Uh, uh, we, we had a computing center. We had 32 uh, computers there where we offered uh, computer training programs. But we also received some money to provide these programs for free. We never saw them as a money generating uh, uh, program. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the whole concept of the center was to be able to provide some space. Uh, that the community could use uh, for their benefit. And uh, unfortunately, the only uh, revenue generating uh, portion of the center are the spaces that are rented to the various vendors. As you know, we have the Wainai Comprehensive Health Center over there. Uh, we have a dental office. Uh, in fact, we, we have a, an eye doctor. Oh. We had a financial company, uh, and then most of the revenues are actually generated by the ballroom, both from the rental of the facility itself and uh, a percentage commission from the food sales uh, by those that cater to this event. Well, everybody loves Filipino food, so that should generate some income from your food service. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that, that's not enough. Uh, no, of course not. Of course not. Does it have um, a museum? Is there a museum 
as a part of the Phil Center? We, we wanted to do that, but uh, there is really no space because every square foot of space, uh, the community center is rented to be able to generate some income. I wish we had a space, even just for a, a small cultural display uh, that can be changed every month or every quarter. That, that would really be nice. It would be. <clears throat> and, and, and the federal government has money for cultural in, I'm, I'm not sure how they, but it's for museums of certain cultures that are dedicated to the culture. And there is federal grant money for that. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there is plenty of money for activities like those. But in the case of the Philcom Center, uh, the need to generate funds is so great so that the debt can be whittled down uh, to something more manageable. Well, now before we run out of time, I have to tell you this story. Well, to you and to our listening audience, it's my one story that I know that I dearly love. And Los Banos, as you know, was in the army. And my husband is a retired submariner. And every year at Memorial Day, uh, military holidays, at the submarine base at Pearl Harbor, at the Parchi Memorial, there is a ceremony dedicated to all of the submarines and submariners that were lost at sea. And so every year, Las Banas would come and some other army people. And I always wonder why is the army here? Because this is all submarines. Well, so the story is that on one of the submarines, the Grudgeon, there were sub a sailor. Well, they were army, but they were on the submarine. So, and they were, and the submarine service was segregated, of course, during World War II. And the, the uh, minorities, there were black and Chinese and Chamorros and Filipinos were messmen. But this group of messmen from California were very well educated. They were special, special forces and they were army. But they would dress them up like messmen, put them on the submarine and then off to the Philippines. And they were special duty but it looked like everybody knew the military was segregated. So they looked like messmen. So nobody paid attention to them. But what they did, they transferred money and supplies and all kinds of things to the war effort in the, Philippine, Philipp, in the Philippine Islands. And nobody suspected that they were spies. No one. And they went through the whole war in and out of the Philippines with no one being the wiser. And I'm, I'm making this really short. So on their last trip, and it's the last day of the war, last few days of the war, everybody knew it was coming to an end. And they're on the submarine coming back to Hawaii. And it was bombed by friendly fire. So they lost everybody on that submarine. And that is why they are at the submarine uh, Parchi is what it's called, the Parchi Memorial. And every year from that day to this, those Filipino soldiers are honored with all of the other Navy submarines. So I have to tell you that story because it's really a special story. You know, Marsha. how I uh, met uh, Domingo. Yeah, I, I have read uh, the, I don't know how many volumes, 10 or 12 volumes of history of the Second World War. But uh, I did come across this particular episode that you, you said. Uh, I think I'm going to take a good look at it. 
yeah, we were aware uh, that there were advanced elements that were inserted by submarines into the Philippines to kind of scout the area, you know, to find out where the military installations were, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, so that this could be fed to General MacArthur so he can figure out how best to retake the Philippines. But I, I, I didn't come across this particular story. If well, you I could send it to you, yes. It's about it, I, I'd like to read about it. Absolutely, but it's my favorite story because like I said, I met Los Banos and we were friends until he died. And in fact, he was the last thing he did was on, on my show. And uh, that was such a special story and it's not told. If, if I hadn't asked why the army is here uh, and, and Los Banos and the other army people were with him in their army uniforms. And then finally, finally, after I kept asking and asking, then the story came to light. And Los Banos said they were called MacArthur's Navy. And so there's all kinds of stories about MacArthur's Navy, but this is, this is the story. And um, it, it was a great subterfuge because, because the Navy was segregated and these, they dressed them up to look like messmen. Even the guys on the submarine didn't know what was going on. They just knew the special, so there. Yeah. And, but um, I will send it to you because it's one of my favorite stories. And um, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us to talk about the Philippines and your heritage. And we'll have to do this again and talk some more about it. Yes. If you don't mind. Uh, there's a lot of things, a lot there's of other things. a lot to talk about, talk yes. About. And now that I have your number, uh, or we well, can communicate this way or by yes. email. We, we, we must tell them. <laughs> there's so many Filipinos in Hawaii. And you know, when I was trying to talk about I kept asking people and they said, well, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure, you know. And, and did you know Abelina Shaw? Yes. Yes. She's practicing law. Yes. She's from well, Hawaii. Yeah. And she was born on the plantation and now she's a big shot. And she worked for uh, Jeremy. Yeah, she was she's the chief, chief of staff. staff. Yeah. And she was, she also served as deputy uh, director of the Department of Health under Ariyoshi. Oh, great. Yeah. So she's a dear friend. And, uh, but anyway, I want to say Mabuhai, is that the right to say aloha? And maraming salama. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you oh, again yeah. so much. And we will do this again. We will talk more. I'm sure Thank everybody you. wants to know more about the Philippines. Will will do. Will do. Okay. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.